Hi everyone and welcome back to week four of Supernatural Folklore. Um, this is the week we start to transition away from talking more generally about folk belief or as Huffer discussed last week, disbelief, and into discussing different uh, beliefs and practices more particularly. Um, you also have a discussion board to complete this week, just as we have every week. Um, you only have to complete 10 discussion boards as part of the course, but I do encourage you not to spend all of your freebies here at the beginning of the semester. Um, the discussion boards are due the same time each week, so I advocate that you get into a routine that works best for you. Um, that includes finishing your reading and your discussion boards. I know that's hard, um, but if you'll get into a routine, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, this week, there's a link to a film called The Changeling, which is from, I think, 1983, uh, George C. Scott. It's a wonderful film. You do not have to watch the entire thing. You only have to watch about 10 minutes of it. I've noted the time um, that I want you to watch. It's a seance scene in the film um, and um, you can find it in various places I have linked to a free site that is showing it um, if you're having trouble with that link please let me know um, so that I can try to help you find a way to uh, watch that scene um, also this week we're gonna start thinking about our research paper now I can hear the groans now um, but it's easier for me to help you if you get started early. Um, so this week you're going to tell me about topics you think you might be interested in writing about. Um, you're not married to these topics at this point, but I do want to know that you have some idea about what kind of research you might want to do and what you might want to talk about. So word of warning. Please pay attention. The number one thing that students do wrong on the research paper is this is not an informative paper only. Um, each semester I have students that want to write a paper and tell me all about vampires. I know about vampires. Um, so you have to make a claim of significance. You have to tell me why it is important for us to know about whatever topic you choose. Now, it might be that we need to better understand how this idea is represented in popular culture or why it is cultural appropriation or how it is misrepresented in popular culture. Examples of this might be if you want to study uh, voodoo as a religion. Um, as a religion, voodoo is, is, is very popular uh, in film and other media, and it is most often um, misrepresented in various ways. And so maybe you want to talk about voodoo and what voodoo is, and um, voodoo is kind of an umbrella term. So you may want to talk about some aspect of that, and you may want to explain why these misrepresentations in popular culture are um, are are, are bad or um, what you want us to know. Um, you, but you have to make a claim of significance. Um, it could be that we need to understand why gender or racial or ethnic representations in a supernatural genre are important. Um, an example of this might be representations of African Americans in horror films. Um, so, there are lots of reasons why what you have to say is important, um, but you have to tell me what those reasons are. I, I don't want to guess. Um, so, research paper proposal is due next Sunday at 11.59 p.m. A couple of paragraphs is fine, but make sure that you're putting something about significance into that research paper proposal. All right, on to the week's readings. Now, Dr. Tim Frandy teaches this course, and he often likes to begin with um, the discussion of divination, and I think that's pretty useful because it's an area of folk belief um, of which many people have at least a passing knowledge. Um, there are many, many, many ways in which people have tried to figure out or divine the future. They range from augury, which is observing signs and omens for predictions, to xylomancy, which are reading scorch patterns on a piece of wood to divine the future. Uh, people have used tea leaves, crystal balls, rune stones, uh, coins, tarot, Ouija, bones, astrology, apple stems, woolly worms. 
Almost anything can or has been used for divination. And even though the Bible has prohibitions against fortune telling, even the Bible has been known to be used for divination as well. Um, knowing the future or knowing about the afterlife is something that happens in every culture all over the world. People seek that knowledge. Um, thus, uh, we have spiritualism, which was a Christian movement popular between about 1850 until around 1820. Um, this movement looks for knowledge of the other world through contact with those who have died. Um, so Kenneth Pimple kind of uh, breaks down the story of spiritualism for us in his article, Ghosts, Spirits, and Scholars, The Origins of Modern Spiritualism. So he details the ways that folk beliefs about spirits and ghosts began to change as spiritualism spread. Um, previously ghosts were thought to be attached to the place that they were killed or they might visit places that were important to them in life. And then you had poltergeists who are nasty boogers who are aggressive and cannot be seen and are typically credited with throwing things around and causing a ruckus. Uh, the Bell Witch is an example of this. Um, they're generally thought to be attached to an object or to a person. Um, while with the concept of spiritualism, Ghosts became unmoored from places. They were no longer tied down. Um, as long as there was a medium present, uh, people could speak directly with spirits. And whereas ghosts were generally thought to be unhappy souls inhabiting the places where they were killed or tragically died, spirits could also be the souls of relatives who had already passed on. Um, thus, mediums or people who were particularly sensitive to spirits could commune with them, and they began using a variety of techniques uh, to communicate. So, Pimple talks about uh, the Fox family, and in the beginning there was rapping, it, knock once for yes, twice for no. Um, there's also automatic writing. Um, you'll see an example of this in the seance scene in The Changeling. Um, this is where the medium goes into a trance and transcribes the words of the spirit, or in some cases, they would be physically possessed by the spirit in order to write the messages. So um, that's kind of what you're going to see in the film The Changeling. This shows up in other places. There's a scene regarding automatic writing in Rose Red, uh, which was a miniseries that came out in, I think, 96 or 7. Um also, if you look in the document um, that contains the pictures that I took at an exhibit called Paranormal America that was at the Speed Museum in Louisville earlier this year, um, you will see an, a, a notebook that has automatic writing in it, and you will also see some automatic writing drawing that was done uh, between a medium and the uh, the writer, William Blake, writer, auto, auto, artist William Blake did a lot of stuff um, so this kind of um, automatic writing was done in a trance like state and is, is another way that mediums um, could communicate with the spirits in the other world so spiritualism, which was a Christian practice, kind of took the world by storm. Um, Post-Civil War in the late 1890s, about 10% of the population were practitioners of spiritualism. So we had some famous folks who participated, including Charles Dickens, who wrote A Christmas Carol, um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was um, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, and Mary Todd Lincoln, who was the wife of Abraham Lincoln, um, and she actually had a seance in the White House. Um, then you also had Harry Houdini, who we know as, um, you know, an escape artist and an illusionist, and he was a huge detractor of spiritualism. He made it his crusade to kind of expose fake mediums for what they were, um, and while, yes, there were a fair amount of fakes in the industry, there were some other things that happened that couldn't be explained quite so easily. Um, so spiritualism was so popular because it combined and hybridized other cultural, social, and scientific phenomena of the day. It combined ghost lore with religious cosmology in a compelling way so that people could have access to individuals who were in the afterlife and had this kind of divine wisdom. Um, it also tapped into rising social movements, for example, suffragettes and abolitionists. 
um, because it promoted gender and racial equality. Um, some other religious movements did the same, like Quakerism. It's also noteworthy that a majority of spiritualists were women. Um, and these women were in a kind of anti-Calvinist way looking for some kind of personal relationship with the divine. Um, Calvinist theory, which uh, is predominantly Protestant theory, really kind of relegates women to a certain role within um, spiritual communities. And these women were um, looking for a way to connect with the divine that didn't include men. So... Finally, and maybe most importantly, Pimple points out that the sciences actually figure into this conversation with spiritualism. Um, most scholars think that spiritualism is a kind of romantic rebellion against technological innovations. That's romantic with an R, the movement, not romantic like the novel, which is lowercase and about love and sex. Um, so, for example, there was this idea that the world is now being explained away and we will take an interest in the magical cosmos, which we have lost. Um, and you see a shift in literature. You'll see romanticism, which is going to include um, the dark romantics like Hawthorne and Poe and Melville. And then you're going to see that move into realism. Um, and then naturalism, naturalism is going to be like uh, Jack London, um, think the short story to build a fire. Um, and then that was kind of the pre-World War I period to modernism, which is going to be 1910 to World War II. Um, spiritualism drew heavily from emerging knowledge about the sciences. So it used, for example, the philosophy of Franz Mesmer, um, who popularized hypnosis, um, and his name is the origin of the word mesmerize. Um, and it tapped into emerging communication technologies, which allowed people to communicate from afar. For example, telegraphs, telephones. Um, people could do labor from afar using electricity. And you could see people from afar using photography or even video cameras. If we can communicate with others hundreds of miles away, is it really so absurd that we could use science to speak to people who have died? Um, today, maybe it's a, absurd to think so, uh, but in the late 1800s, maybe less so. All of these technologies were new and emerging, um, and people were fascinated by them and fascinated by the possibilities that they contained. Um, so rather than rejecting science because everyone around them is embracing it, Pimple says that spiritualism is more like putting the two together. Um, they are embracing scientific mysticism, right? They're trying to use science to explain why and where these spirits exist. This is, so spiritualism wasn't a rejection of science. It was actually incorporating science and scientific practice into um, this kind of study of the supernatural. So ultimately, there were at least some mediums who were frauds, and their exposure led to a growing skepticism and eventual decline of spiritualism as a religious movement in the early 1900s. Um, there was a brief resurgence of some of those practices following World War II, uh, when people who had lost loved ones turned to these practices to try to reconnect with those lost loved ones. But by 1920, these efforts had pretty much subsided. Um, but... Spiritualists and seances still exist in popular culture. Um, that is what you're going to see in that film clip from The Changeling. And the idea of supernatural mediums existing is still very much alive. Uh, just take a look at any ghost hunters or any other Discovery Plus ghost hunting paranormal activity type of show. And you're going to find at least one medium. Um, some people still have seances today and they still use some of these practices and one of the commonly used ways to try to contact spirits is the Ouija board. Now I changed up the reading a little from your, um, I, I'm changing up the reading a little bit from your, um, 
course schedule. Um, I had an article on there by Jillian Bennett, and we are going to read that article, but I think I'm going to save it for a little bit later when we talk more about uh, particular beliefs in ghosts and things like that. Instead, we're going to talk a little bit about Ouija this week, and we're going to look at uh, Bill Ellis's article about Speak to the Devil. Um, so maybe rapping, um, knocking, rapping, not like, you know, Eminem rapping, uh, was the first means of communicating with the dead in spiritual spiritualist tradition, but it wasn't necessarily the most practical. I mean, you can pretty much get a yes or no and maybe some numbers. Um, so several forms of spirit communications emerged, including the talking board, which was first documented in 1886, um, which was the basic board that included yes, no, letters, numbers, and the phrases good eve and good night. Um, does that sound familiar? Uh, in 1890, businessman Charles Kennard and Elijah Bond, a patent attorney, and Colonel Washington Bowie started the Ken Kenner, sorry, Kennard Novelty Company to market these kinds of talking boards. And many think the name emerged from the French and German words for yes, which is we oui and ja. Uh, Bond's sister-in-law was actually a medium, and she consulted the board to name itself, and it named itself Ouija. Um, if you want to uh, know more, you can check out an article in Smithsonian Magazine, um, and I will put the link to that um, in, in the content for this week if you want to take a look. Um, the Ouija board occupied a strange place in American culture. It is a mystical oracle. You are in contact with the dead. But it's also wholesome family entertainment. It is still sold in the game section of stores. Um, it's a spiritualist tool, but it's disliked by most mediums who see it as kind of cheapening their labor. Um, and throughout most of the 20th century, the Ouija board wasn't seen as particular in a particularly nefarious, all right? That has certainly changed. Um, there were a few instances prior to that, prior to the, I'd say, 70s, 80s, 90s, of Ouija boards instructing people to murder. Um, but, you know, that's just going to happen when you're dealing with the spirit world, I guess. Um, the boards were very mainstream, much more so than they are today. This started to change in 1973 with the release of the film The Exorcist. And The Exorcist is actually a really interesting cultural phenomenon. It changed a lot of people's thinking about um, not only the Ouija, which there is a Ouija scene in the film, but also about um, the role of Catholic priests in home in you know in these kinds of, of rituals the idea of possession the idea of demons um erica brady who is a um a former professor in this department um wrote a really interesting article about the ways that um um priesting changed in the wake of the exorcist and that people who weren't catholic were suddenly contacting priests to come and bless their house because of um, some kind of ill feeling there. So um, the exorcist is an interesting cultural phenomenon from that standpoint. Um, then there was the rise of the so-called satanic panic in the United States. Um, so some resistance to Ouija boards predated all of this because of its ties to spiritualism, but it isn't seen as a tool of the devil until more recent times. Now, most people attribute the Satanic Panic's origins to the release of a book called Michelle Remembers, um, which supposedly recounts the recovered memory, memories of a woman who was sexually abused in a Satanic cult. Um, now, as it turns out, none of this happened. Um, but that didn't make a whole lot of difference. Anxiety still grew about satanic cults engaged in animal and even human, human sacrifice throughout rural America, and those things persist today. Um, these rumors were greatly exaggerated. So a few years ago, there was a clown scare when, um, people were supposedly seeing clowns lurking all over the place. Um, 
there was a ton of press over little to nothing happening. So the satanic panic is kind of like that, only on a bigger scale. Um, people started seeing the influence of Satan everywhere after the satanic panic. And um, you could find it in rock music played backward in the birthmark on Mikhail Gorbachev's head and most certainly in Ouija boards. So some of this stuff still continues to resurface today. Back in 2001 in New Mexico, there were people burning Ouija boards, Harry Potter books, and ACDC records, all because they represented the devil and were an intrusion of the devil into the lives specifically of children and teenagers. Um, in 2011, Pat Robertson warned against Harry Potter and Ouija boards. Um, U.S. Senate candidate Christine O'Donnell once warned on Bill Maher's old show, Politically Incorrect, that on Halloween people fall victims to human sacrifice. And by the way, literally, no, that has never happened. Um, importantly, um, none of this actually has much to do with Satanism, which leads us to Ellis's chapter and the social functions of the Ouija the social functions of Ouija use in terms of Christian cosmology. So if you read Bill Ellis's article, there are a few um, points I'd like to highlight. They center around the fact that even though the Ouija is so commonly associated with satanic practice and the invocation of demonic spirits, it's really embedded firmly within a Christian mental landscape. Um, after all, the vast majority of Ouija board users ad identify as Christian and specifically as Christian teenagers. So we'll tell you a little story about this. Um, just last night, my daughter had a sleepover um, with one of her little friends and her little friend brought a Ouija board. Um, now, because I do what I do, um, I routinely make sure that our house is protected by every folkloric means possible. We have salt, we have candles, we have smudged. Um, I like to laugh and say our house is the most protected house on the block when it comes to evil spirits. Um, so she brought this Ouija board in and I of course instructed them on uh, the use of it. And so I, I put them in a circle um, and I told them that they had to stay inside the circle. They were protected as long as they were in the circle. Um, so uh, it was very interesting. They, um, there was no subterfuge there. They were really like, is there a spirit here? And they got nothing, um, which they then blamed on me because I put them in a protective circle and I kept everything out. So um, it was very interesting to watch them and their practice is nine uh, year olds was very different from the things that I've seen from 13, 14, 15 year olds who are using a Ouija. Um, so Ellis notes that all Ouija board rituals follow more or less similar formats. There's the invocation of a spirit. Spirit, are you here? What is your name? There's usually some sort of questioning of the spirit uh, to try to verify who or what it is. There's the naming of the spirit, kind of determining the background and determining whether or not the spirit is good or evil. Uh, you know, that's always interesting to me. Um, evil spirits don't usually lie and say that there's something good. They usually just come right on out and say they're the devil, right? Um, then there's usually testing the spirit, which is where you ask it questions with verifiable answers. Um, you may ask it a question of who's dating so-and-so or what is someone's middle name or how old are they or something like that where the the user is kind of testing the spirit's knowledge are they aware of things that they otherwise would not know um, then there's some sort of dialogue with the spirit um, in which usually in most stories the spirit's answers get increasingly unhinged um, then there is usually some kind of confrontation with the spirit, demanding signs of its reality. And then there is a move to terminate contact with the spirit. Um, Ellis noticed the same format for engaging with spirits is not unique. In fact, it carefully uh, mirrors the ritual of exorcisms. Um, and he says this is not a coincidence. The fictional narrative that helped launch the satanic panic um, is the same one that kind of led to this rise in the use of Ouija. 
So Ellis uses the concept of an anti-ideology or an anti-world to understand why so many Christians are tempted to use Ouija boards. Um, ultimately, it's a vehicle that's used to express and confront their subconscious fears, according to Ellis. And rather than challenging their beliefs, um, the use of the Ouija actually reinforces those Christian beliefs. Um, it allows Christians to participate in an, anti in an activity called myth-making. Um, myths and mythologies are not just falsehoods. They are creation stories, and they're generally regarded as sacred, um, and all cultures have them. Um, sometimes we tend to classify other people's creation stories as myths and our own creation stories as sacred text. Um, but myths generally uh, exist in a time before time, before the world worked as it currently does. So animals might talk to humans, uh, gods might walk on earth, um, that sort of thing. So myth making, as Ellis refers to it, involves the things people do that allow them to participate in the Christian myth directly. So while we might hear stories about angels and demons, using a Ouija board allows us to contact them directly. It allows us to experience the mythology of angels and demons firsthand, to touch it and to realize that it's not isolated in some distant past, but accessible to us. All right. So it intensifies users' connection with religion, and that is an irresistible feeling for any for believers of any faith. Now, the other thing that Ellis points out that it does is that there's usually in these stories some kind of mention of some sort of um, bad communication or some evil thing happening, and then. Um, in part of the story, the Christians cast away the Ouija board and then they triumph over this evil spirit. Um, sometimes that's done by returning to a life of faith and prayer. Um, other times that's from invocation of the Holy Spirit to kind of um, back off these more malevolent spirits. So um, Ellis here is kind of reinforcing the idea that the Ouija board, um, while the stories about it say one thing, the way that it functions for the culture that uses it is a kind of uh, validation, justification of religious belief in that the only thing that will overcome the evil of the Ouija is um, true Christian faith. So uh, interesting article. If you're interested in Ouija boards, there are certainly lots of them out there. Um, the one that uh, was brought to our house was especially endearing to me because it was called the um, the Halloween Witch Board. Um, and if you are one of the very few people that is familiar with Halloween uh, 3, which it has no Michael Myers in it, so nobody wants to watch it. Um, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, the, um, the Shamrock um, Company, um, and this board was decorated after that. So as a huge John Carpenter fan, I was, I was a little, I had a little smile on my heart about this particular board. Uh, but there are lots of boards out there and um, the use of them, the way that they look and the use of them over time has changed considerably. So um, that is my lecture for this week. I clock in 28 minutes. Please don't forget to do your discussion boards. Please go back and take a look at the discussion boards from last week. We have a great group of students who are very insightful and thoughtful in their discussion board postings, and you can learn a lot from them um, if you will go back and read those posts. I should have your quizzes graded uh, relatively quickly, and if you have any questions about anything for this week, the research paper proposal, um, please let me know, and I will be happy to answer those for you. Thanks, and have a great week, guys. I'll see you soon.